All right, so I'm um, not Rasmus, as you can tell. Um, but if you're here yesterday, he was sitting over here and had a bad throat, and so I told him not to worry about it. If he couldn't talk, you know, I'd find so someone to swap in, and in worst case, I could give the talk. So I'll, I'll be talking about um, this slot, just if you were, were just showing up. Um, so it was, it's sort of been nice to be at a meeting where people don't have talks about neural networks every other talk. So, <laughs> so okay, but so there'll be two. There'll be two. We put them on the third day, so so that's. To, um, so we, we started thinking about this a little bit because if you do these this random, I, so I'll describe something we've been talking about recently, but in particular in the context and maybe of what this meeting's about. And we've always been saying, you know, you need to compute matrices for a lot of data problems. But the dirty little secret was until recently you didn't really. I mean, the hard part was moving the bits around and then just do anything and it'll work. So things weren't computationally intensive. Um, and so now that's changing, and the use case for that is, is neural networks, which really, you know, analogous to like high performance computing when you do simulations that are really computationally intensive. I mean, 10 years ago with machine learning kernels, that wasn't the case. For now for neural networks, it is the case. And so we, we have a bunch of results. We've been thinking about how to use some of the second order methods, some of the sampling methods there. Um, and a lot of that has to do with training. You want to train a big model, and the training's expensive. So here, imagine that you don't want to train. Um, that you want to try and understand what's going on. Because when you train, it's hard to answer a why question, because you fiddle with lots and lots of parameters. And if you fiddle with lots and lots of parameters, it's hard to pull out you know, why something works. And so um, that's one reason why. We just wanted to understand what's going on. The other reason is um, you know, training these models costs you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. There was something put out recently, an order billion dollars with a B, that you know, it costs to train a single model. And so if you're not at one of a handful of companies, it's hard to compete with that. right? So we go to the other extreme, and we said, don't Okay. Um, there's a lot of models out there, and you could just go look at their properties. You know, why do they work? You know, can, can you learn some properties of them? In particular, what can you learn from um, spectral statistics? Let's say eigenvectors and eigenvalues and stuff. If you sort of you know measure stuff and think through the implications of that, so you need to use ideas from random matrix theory. And surprisingly, there's very little random matrix theory and randomized linear algebra. That's something that sort of struck me always. You use a few concentration bounds, but random you know random for matrix theory that's usually common. So you know, use that here and sort of think through the implications of that. So that's what we did. And if you think through the implications of that, I think you can sort of understand in a pretty strong sense why it works and why the way theory is often parameterized is a hard time for understanding that. So I'll describe this, but um, I'll, I'll sort of de describe it a little bit in the context of what we're talking about. And um, feel free to interrupt, right? It's, it's a small audience. So there'll be a lot of stuff I gloss over, but I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how we were using this at least in one pipeline. So, um, so I think a lot of people do neural networks because they're practical things, but, but you may also want to, you know, what, where are the fault lines on random sampling and randomized linear algebra? And if you think through that, um, you know, foundations of data, there's a lot of pr very sort of foundational questions about generalization and, and, and when that works, and do you peek at training data and test data and so on. Um, we want it as a practical theory. And, and so by a practical theory, I don't mean, you know, VC theory or something that um, you wouldn't use. People, you wouldn't use VC theory to compute a, uh, you know, a, a, a regularization parameter. They'd do cross-validation in the old days, and they'd do something else with these things, but something you might want to use. Um, and so th this is sort of the perspective we'll, we'll uh, take. Are you, are you hand up for a second? Or? Just before I, for, I, I guess the w one thing I said earlier really piqued my interest is, what was the model that took a billion dollars to train? So this was, um, I didn't say what it was because I was going to misstate it, but I think it, it's, not being, for me, video games, you know, there's Pac-Man and there's Space Invaders. This is some you know, video games that were here th around 30 years ago. So it's, it's some, I think it's Alpha Star or something. And, 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 you know, it's reinforcement learning and you need to train. This isn't public information because they're not going to say we well, spent a billion dollars and lost 500 million this quarter. So someone had you uh, do an estimate. And for the last stage of, of training, it costs, you know, lower bound was 700 million. Dollars and um, and so um, I think it's Deep Mind and Alpha Star, but I, I could dig it out for you. So so I d don't quote me on that because it, but it's one of these big RL things in a video game framework, and and this is only for the last step, you know. So I mean, never mind how many you know parameter fiddling steps you had before that, and so the, so you know I, I saw later you know I was at a meeting a week or two ago and someone put up a model and said oh it costs one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and that's the equivalent of buying three cars and driving it twenty years in terms of carbon footprint. So you're putting these things on GPUs, you're dissipating an incredible amount of heat and so on, so you need to be, and so um, you think $150,000 is a lot, and someone says, oh, that's, that seems like a lot. So, you know, that seems like a little compared to, you know, 700 million or order billion. So, um, 
Yeah, so the, the MO in the area is develop a new method, fiddle parameters, find the place where you're better, and, and show that you're better, right? And so that's, um, that's a hard game to win when you're, you know, say, at a university. And we have relatively a, a lot of resources c compared to university because we go to get it. But it's, it's, it's zero compared to that, uh, however many significant digits, right? So, I mean, it, so we want to understand, you know, what if you, what if you couldn't train? And, and it's not a totally unreasonable question, right? The, CS, there's a shift when you look at the internet, look at social networks. These are things in the world, measure their properties and try and learn something. And no one publishes bad models. So, so, so yeah, well, that, okay, there's a caveat there, and I, I'm well aware of the caveat, but, but no one publishes bad models and presents them as such. So this, this is a little bit analogous to, you know, I do a drug trial. I give you the sick and the healthy drugs. Um, so, so I do a control, and, and some number of people are not there a year later. To interview, and so there's a selection bias, and, and this is a well-known problem. So, so you know, you're, you're interviewing the the healthy patients, so the ones who are treated successfully. You're not interested in the one you're interviewing the ones who died, right? And so this is a little analogous to that. So we're doing a post-mortem on successful models that are good models by some measure, even if it's just you know the, the measures of computer vision, or whatever. And, and so you know, this is a phenomenon of the world. They work in, in some sense, and so why? And what are the what are the properties that make them work? All right. So, um, so we, Fred, but we're guilty of this, where you know you're doing optimization, you try and chase epsilons and deltas. So, we did this because how do you evaluate an algorithm otherwise? And a lot of people that do gradient methods chase epsilons and deltas and say we're better because we're epsilon, better on epsilon and delta fronts. And that's a little bit like you know on training and test curves. This is a well-defined metric, and you're better on that. Um, is that what you want? So, so the usual MO is, you know, you assume some convexity structure. Fred was talking about people oftentimes make strong convexity, and we want to go with slightly weaker um, assumptions. And so this is nowhere near where the methods are applied. And so is, is what you learn from that analysis at all correlated with why the methods are useful? And I think the answer is probably, you know, in a lot of cases, no, right? So the Newton MR thing is interesting, not just for the theoretical result present Fred described, but also because if you do disordered systems in, in physics, you know, you can use this as a root finder and find roots, you know, of, uh, you know, saddle points, basically. And understanding the saddle point landscape of something tells you a lot. And so the way you'd use it is very different than the, the sort of existing theory. Um, VC theory I mentioned, you know, do you, who, do you if you're going to use this method, do you say, here's my VC complexity client? No, no, you just do something. And, and so the theory is oftentimes pretty divorced from the practice. So um, sort of some theoretical, you know, and as a sort of practical motivation, you know, how, you know, when is a network fully optimized? Say that you couldn't, say that you had, I had, you, you had to go to a desert island and, um, and you have to take some metric with you and, um, and you need to predict whether the model I show you tomorrow, which I'm going to tell you is, a, is, is maybe a good model in some sense, whether that's good. How would you do that? And if you're theoretically inclined, you probably say, well, I need to know the complexity, you know, the distribution. No, no, you go to a desert island and bring, you know, some metric with you. And this is something people do all the time in engineering, right? They look at a bridge, they tickle it, they say it's, it's good, they don't prove a, a complexity result, and, and they have, maybe have a parameterized model. And um, sometimes they're wrong and the bridge falls, but, but oftentimes, you know, they're right. And so, so do something like, so, you know, can you come up with a metric that doesn't, in particular, that doesn't look at the data? Because that, every time you look at the data, you peek a little bit, you cheat a little bit, you overfit a little bit. So why do I not want to look at the data? The people who spent $700 million training their model aren't going to share with me their data. And so I want to look at the model they give me, and is it fully optimized? Could I optimize more? Is there a bit more juice to squeeze out of it? You know, these sort of questions. So um, large batches versus small batches, something we've thought a lot about. Um, convex theory says large batches are better because you get a better gradient estimate, and so you get somewhere faster. Um, people who do implementations, latency and throughput, large batches are better because you can parallelize better. Are large batches better if you want you know, to solve some downstream problem? And so we'll see that the answer is you know, oftentimes no. Again, sort of a qualitative disconnect. So um, these are sort of theoretical and practical sort of motivations here. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit less time talking. There's a lot of connections with sort of statistical mechanics, which if you know, Machine learning and graphical models maybe isn't so surprising. Um, we started out, you know, when we were, we, we saw this is a paper that got a lot of attention that said, um, here's something we see, which is sort of a count as a function of a penalty. Um, 
And they said, this looks like a spin glass. And they had a bunch of equations. And they drive something. And this has gotten a lot of attention. And we looked at that. This was with, with Charles Martin. It was on the first slide. And he had a similar background. And we said, no, a spin glass is a very complicated thing. You can get away with a much, much weaker model, you know, like a random energy model, and get something similar. And you know, if, in particular, if you knew not spin glass theory, but sort of soft condensed matter physics, which he and I happen to know, you years ago saw you know, sort of um, similar plots. This is a count of something, and this is something like an entropy. It's a free energy. If your eyes are good, you see that I turned the plot around, because in, in that area, they didn't plot stuff the same way. And you saw something very similar. And so we saw that and said, boom. I mean, where this is a, a drill down on this. Um, and I mention this because we're going to use the idea. It, it, essentially, the, the, the leading order bit here is um, you're developing a model. If you get a factor of 10 more data, you don't keep the model the same and vice versa. You make the model more complex. So essentially, you're going to a limit where the model complexity and data points diverge together. And that's a much harder limit to deal with, right? All the stuff we've talked about um, here. I mean, you, you need a factor of d or d log. Dave was talking about yesterday. You, know, you need a factor of d or d log d to get something to concentrate, to get, um, you know, to get a subspace embedding, whatever, meaning you fix this and you let this diverge. So a much harder limit to deal with is when they both diverge together. That, that's a, a special case of that's a thermodynamic limit. And so, um, and, and so that's sort of what's in the background here that I'll allude to a little bit later. But it suggests that parametrizing things in certain ways isn't going to work, because you maybe can't get worst case results in that limit, or you have to get you know, um, some of the sort of results. So I think that's sort of why. Um, this is sort of a challenging thing for some people. So the basic setup, <coughs> if you don't know it, you, you have some you know, transformation. Think of it as a matrix. You feed it through a um, you know, nonlinearity of some sort, and you iterate the process you know, 100 times if you're 100 layers deep. Um, and you train this on labeled data. So the usual MO here is just add gobs and gobs of parameters. Make yourself wide, deep, whatever. You, you put some thought into the structure of the architecture using domain knowledge, but that, that's an art currently. And um, you minimize an objective. You push data points through. You look at the error. You backprop. So backpropagate the error. So backprop is an is a efficient way to backpropagate the error. And so you should think of this as a penalty landscape. It's not quite like an objective function you write down. You know, y is equal to alpha x squared. Alpha is your parameter. Um, but it's a little like that. But you've got to determine alpha. But you, know, you don't have one alpha. You have a huge, huge number of alpha. You might have a lot more data, you know, parameters than data points and so on. So, um, so you know, the, the, the properties of that landscape as a function of uh, alpha are very non-trivial. <clears throat> All right. And if you guys are showing up late, Rasmus was called in six, so we had to get a substitute here. Um, and so in particular, the structure of this penalty is changing at every, every step. And in the quadratic case, you know, as you change alpha, the, the shape of the quadratic you know, varies. You know, how wide are you? But if you have these nonlinearities and you have more parameters and data points, you, you can have much um, sort of richer behavior that can be a little bit hard to understand. So <clears throat> nominally, it looks, the surface looks like this. It's not convex. So convex problems, I don't know, um, Mark, maybe you're not a convex person. But if you were, so convex, uh, convex problems are problems where you can close your eyes. Someone that does, does good software gives you back the exact answer, right? I mean, so uh, linear algebra, right? I mean, th there's subtleties about, but basically, just you know, someone can abstract away all the internals and just give you an answer, right? Um, and that's great because it allows you to, to do that. Normally, these are not convex, so there's nothing you can say. Everything's hopeless um, as, a, as a mathematical point. Is that, is that a problem? You know, is, is, this, is this really a problem? You go to your desert island tomorrow, is this going to be a problem? Um, and the answer is no. I mean, practically, it's just noticed that this is never an issue. They always look like this. They're either convex or quasi convex. Local minima are just never a problem. Why is that? I mean, it could be because they're really convex and you didn't know it. It could be because you have so many knobs to fiddle with in the training process, like dropout and learning rates and batch size, that they can adjust this. And so you have so many knobs that, that it's never a problem because you engineer it not to have a problem. I mean, who knows, right? So this is the question. So why is this? Why do you, is, is this never a problem? <clears throat> and so this is not a new observation. I mean, you go back 30 years, um, people that currently are well known for doing neural networks you know, would say, um, um, you know, maybe the, VC, the effect of VC dimension is a lot less because the model can only access some number of minima. Um, four years later, um, you know, that's not what's going on. I mean, you know, there's not, no minima here. We just never hit these minima. And so, and so something else must be going on. And so what's, what's going on? <coughs> so it's, it's, these issues are being revisited now, but these are not sort of new observations in some sense. They're old enough that they work themselves into textbooks by 2000. Okay. <coughs> so, one thing I'm going to be asking is using sort of randomized linear algebra tools to, to in an a posterior 
or a way to sort of characterize what's going on. So the, the MO should be, um, I'm going to, back to, you know, I give you code and you solve a problem. It, it, say that I promise you I'm solving least squares. It might be over, under, constrained. It might be regularized. I'm not going to tell you that. But something least squares like. But I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. Is it L1? Is it L2 regression? L3? I'm not going to tell you. Can you send me data? And I give you back a, an answer. Can you figure out what my code does? And if you give me data, and I always give you sort of a solution that's smudged out a bit, you might say it looks a little bit like he's doing you know, ridge regression. And you know, sure enough, you open the code, and I'm calling LAPAC.ridge regression, or Python.ridge regression, or whatever. Um, and I always give you back a sparse answer. You look inside my code. Oh, yeah, he just you know, calls CVX.lasso. OK. What if you look inside my code, and, and I always give you back a sparse solution, and it's just a mess of spaghetti code. It's going left. It's going right, up, upside down. But I always give you back this sparse solution. It's, it's plausible to say, I may not even know it, but what this mess of code is doing is solving um, L1 you know, lasso type regression. So that's the MO we're going to take. We're going to look at spectral statistics of trained things to answer this question. What problem are you solving? Now, the problem is regularization is sort of the elephant in the room. And regularization used to be f plus lambda g. There's a parameter there. You cross that, whatever. Um, in this business, you're not solving a convex problem, meaning I can't divorce the problem from the algorithm. Little details of the algorithm matter a lot, not in a numerical sensitivity way that you know you think the 13th digit doesn't. I mean, a leading order bit. And so you make some minor little change, boom, everything changes. You may drop something out. If you don't know what drop out is, it's what you think. You drop something out in, in the model. You're early stopping. You train 10 steps of an iteration and not 20. Batch size. You know, the convex theory says bigger is better. Is, it turns out batch size is a regularization parameter. It, it, it's not thought of as because it's an endogenous computational parameter, but if it walks like a duck, it talks like it. And so it has all the empirical signatures of regularization. Noisify the day. I mean, every knob and switch, everything you would want to fiddle with, um, oftentimes for computational reasons, oftentimes because, you know, whatever, has this effect. And so you sort of emasculate regularization of its meaning if everything becomes regularization. Um, and so this was got some attention recently a few years ago. So I wanted to oversimplify a few things. <coughs> um, um, much coarser than are you weak or strong rank revealing QR versus S. I mean, take a step back. A lot of regularization boils down to ridge regression. Ridge regression says I solve least squares. I have something where things are a little unstable. Put a lambda times an identity to wash that out. So what lambda times an identity does is introduce a scale. Below that, things don't matter. Above that, things do. So you think of this as noise. You think of this as signal I can't resolve, you know, whatever. So if there's a scale below that is noise, above that's um, signal. So that's the same as lasso. There's a lambda. Below that's noise. Above that's signal. It, it zeroes things out in different ways. But um, this is no different than SVMs, right? You know, that depends maybe on labels, but there's a scale below that signal, a noise above that signal. So most um, regularization, and this is a convenient thing to deal with, right? Because you could say I'm going to deal with a top K subspace. I mean, a lot of randomized linear algebra boils down. I get a top K subspace, and I parameterize relative to that, or I wash out the bottom part of the spectrum. Um, <clears throat> Early you know, theorem, 10 steps of a uh, iterated power method exactly solves f plus lambda g, where f is a Rayleigh quotient and g is something you can easily write down. Right? That's not the way it's usually described, but that's true. We, sh we showed that about 10 years ago. Random walks. I mean, a lot of these things will implicitly solve something of this form. So if I do three steps of a power method, Ianos was talking the other day about diffusions on a graph. If I diffuse a few steps and truncate in a certain way theorem, I exactly solved implicitly f plus lambda g, where f is essentially a least squares on the edge incidence matrix. G is essentially a lasso, an L1 type objective. You can call CVX, but you wouldn't want to do this on a billion node graph. Or you can run five steps of a diffusion and truncate in the right way, which is under the hood in what he was doing, actually. He didn't describe it that way. But, so you, know, you can run procedures and exactly solve things in this form. And most of them introduce a scale. And so do I run three steps or 10 steps? That's your lambda. That's a scale. So I, I mentioned that because we're gonna, there's going to be sort of a scale-free type of regularization that emerges here. Um, OK, so different types of regular. So here's the model, the objective we had up before. Different types of regularization, maybe different norms may leave different empirical signatures on W, the, the, this, this query axis model I was describing. So what we're going to do is try and turn off all regularization. Now, that's hard because everything's regularization. So we're, we're using theory to develop new theory, not a theorem, right? And so it's not a, a math statement I want to make here. We're using it. Um, we're going to systematically turn it back on, one thing at a time. Because it's hard to answer a why question if you're optimizing the training and test error and you have to adjust 50 knobs to do that. We want to run a control, like a scientific control, change one thing at a time, and then ask, is that what's responsible for what we saw? And we're going to look at empirical properties of W, where, where 
in one or two cases, this will train. So it, it's not like we trained on at all. But think of this as talking about state-of-the-art models. I'm not saying I can find some funny thing that behaves this way. This is state-of-the-art models. So think of it that way. Um, I'll, I'll say something towards the end about sort of a rugged penalty landscape, but um, time permitting. But OK, what happens to the weight layer matrix? So, so, the, the, so, so you have a bunch of layers. This convolution says this, says that. But think of it as a matrix or some, some sort of structure. And then you feed it to the next level. Um, so we're going to in particular look at weight matrices. You could look at activations. You could look at Hessians and some of these things. We've done things like that. Um, that's a bit harder because sometimes you need the data to do that. So we're going to, if, if you give me a model, you've essentially given me an architecture and a bunch of weight matrices. So I want to look at something after the fact. So I'm doing this post-mortem on the live and the and patients. Um, if you now do training on Lynette 5 on MNIST, if you don't know the area, this is something that was state-of-the-art 20 years ago. Not now, but, but it's, it's not a toy. It's a real thing from 20 years ago. Um, and you can look at a couple other three-layer MLP. These are, you know, is a relatively simple thing. Mini AlexNet will be sort of a simple thing to work with. It's going to be representative of a bunch of bigger things that, will, that I'll show you. And then a wide range, and, and I'm going to have a half dozen here, but we've looked at thousands of things by now. And so, um, you know, wide range of state-of-the-art models. Um, <clears throat> all right, preliminary, um, simple model. Um, how do you measure if something's good or low rank or whatever? You look at the spectrum. And so let's, let's say we look at eigenvalue decay. So what I have right uh, on the right, let's say, is the stable rank. It's a spectral divided by the Frobenius norm. <clears throat> X-axis is training this toy model. So this takes 10 minutes. This isn't $700 million. This, this is something that, you know, this is that toy. And you see that the stable rank starts out at 120 depending on whether you're looking at the first connected layer or the second connected layer, and it decreases to 100 or to 60. So you're cooking in some correlations so the rank's decreasing. X-axis is time, time, number of epoch, then training time. So that's, I don't know if that's good or bad. It's, it's what it is. It, it, you're suggesting you're getting something a little bit more low rank. Low rank might be more regularized, right, because you're, you're feeding through a low rank space. Um, you can look at matrix entropies. This looks like it decreases a lot. Um, it, of course, you can't see what the, the y-axis is. This is 0.92. That's 0.91. Pull out a layer. Look at the, mat look at the eigenvalues of that layer. So, so the entropy is the matrix entropy, which is the entropy of the eigenvalues. The rank is the rank of that layer. Yeah. This is a three-layer MLP. So there's one, two, and three. So this is, these are the two layers of that. So um, entropies. That, that seems like it changes. But of course, that's 0.92 to 0.91. The fact that it's smooth suggests it's a real effect. But if I was to put the zero on the scale, it would be about you know, 50 feet down or something. So, this, this, so that's not a big change. It's from 0.92 to 0.91. Is this a big deal or not? So you know, we didn't know. And how do you analyze it? And it was hard to tell. <coughs> so um, <coughs> scree plots, eigenvalue decay plots. If you really are an expert in look and stare, I mean, you can tell them. But to first order, they say nothing, because they just go down and to the right. So, um, so what we did is looked at a histogram. So you need to know the right lens to look at. So this is the same data, actually, we just presented two plots back, but in, in a much more revealing way. Let's look at the singular values. There's a difference between singular values and eigenvalues depending on the aspect ratio of the matrices and so on. So I'm going to gloss over that. Um, and so the um, red is before training. When you train these things, you start off with an initial random, you, know, initial, you, you randomize the, um, the weights randomly. That's just what people do. We're asking not what you could do, what do people do. They start off randomly. And you get this, boom. And so if you know anything about random matrix theory, that's Wigner semicircle law. So the aspect ratios, that's the quarter circle version. That's Wigner semicircle law. And at the end of training, you look like this, and then boom, something sits there. So the change in entropy you saw was just these things pulling out slightly. So is that a real effect or not? Before, it wasn't so clear. This looks very real. You do it many times, it's real. This is well above the, so Wigner semicircle law is interesting because there's fluctuational effects at the edge there that I'll get back to. But when we saw this, we knew we were onto something. Because this is a spiked covariance model. It, it says there's a bulk. There's a few spikes that pull out. The spike you think has signal. This you're going to model as noise. And it may have signal buried into it. We saw this, and we knew this was the tip of a good iceberg. A lot of the randomized linear algebra says, I, I know I'm low rank, and I want to be epsilon good relative to low rank. If you have a model and you have any noise, you're actually not so well approximated by something low rank, because you get a bulk in the residual subspace. The bulk will look something like that. That's actually a lot of Frobenius mass. So a lot of the worst case theory we do you know, you're on thin ice because there's a big bulk of mass there. And that's, that's what this is. Is this thing low rank? I mean, that captures some Frobenius mass. It doesn't capture 95% of the Frobenius mass. It might capture 10. Those are the most important directions. But it's not low rank in the sense that we usually use the word. The 
this is a histogram. The eigenvalues go from 0 to 2 and a half. How many eigenvalues do I have in that bin? Or sing singular eigenvalues, yeah. If you look at eigenvalues, not singular values, I'm glossing over it for the talk now. Don't go home and implement it and gloss over it, because this is what you'll get if you do it the wrong way, which doesn't say anything. So you've got to look through the right lens in order to get the, very, you know, to get the semicircle. And this depends on the aspect ratio and the things I was telling you about. So is that a case where you think maybe like truncated SVD would be more effective than <coughs> So if you apply this to MNIST, I cut there, throw off the weight, use just that at the layer. I, give, I forget the exact numbers, but yeah. I get 95% prediction accuracy. So is 95% good or bad on MNIST? Yeah. Bad, because it's not 99. It's better than 10. So I can get from 10 to 95 by looking at eight eigenvectors. Now, of course, to squeeze the juice, you know, I got to go for, to get 95 to 99.8, you need another 492 eigenvectors. So, yeah, so it's. A is the, are the singular values of W. Of, of, of the W, yeah, yeah. And, and B, the eigenvectors of what? This? It's the yeah. same thing. This is, it, that to that is just take the square root of the square. So W transpose W. W transpose W is the, R, is the, the object we're looking at. The squares of the singular values. So you, you square this. And do they have the same scales, the graphs? No, this is 6 or 7. 2.5 squared is 7. Yeah, it's hard to compare them. That's the point. You've got to look through the right lens. Because if you just put down a. have the same scale, you know, the same units. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the point is here, if you look at it the wrong way, it just goes down. You've got to look at it through. I mean, random matrix says look a certain way. And this is the lens to look through. And, and this wouldn't tell you anything. <coughs> so we're not spending $700 million to do this. These, these are 500 by 1,000 matrices. So there's nothing complicated here. In Python, that's your implementation. I mean, it takes five lines, right? If it was in MATLAB, it would take 10 lines or whatever, right? So um, OK, so, um, so that's sort of what's going on. So here's the heavy, here's the, this is, I learned about randomized, random matrix theory when you're doing this, because as I said, you never need random matrix theory or randomized linear algebra. So um, to oversimplify a, a, a lot of details, um, random matrix, there's two things going on here. Um, one is there's a bulk property. And you saw a version of that with a quarter circle. Here's a half circle. Um, and that's what most people focus on. We're going to want to know what's coming out. And so I actually want to know something around the edge here. This is not a usual Gaussian fluctuation. It's, it's, it's a different universality class. It appears in a lot of sort of complicated or correlated systems. The protein example is one model of, of a protein because you have a complicated correlation. But the idea is here in the bulk, you have one thing going on because eigenvectors are correlated in complicated ways, whereas out here, each one sort of sits by itself. And so if you have, you know, it, it can fluctuate around in sort of roughly a Poisson way. And so you get two different forms of deviations. And basically, we, we want to certify that um, the things we see are, are not here but out here. And so the, the edge properties, so we're going to develop a theory based on bulk properties and edge properties um, to predict sort of why these things are with it going on. Um, these are the equations. So if I'm not, rec if I'm not um, a square, if I'm rectangular, Wigner doesn't hold, but a generalization called uh, marchenko pasteur holds. The form of marchenko pasteur is this. It's not a semicircle, but it looks like this depending on the aspect ratio. The point is it's a well-defined thing, and you converge to that. You converge to 4. You have the same Tracy Widom stuff here. So it's not as simple as I was described in terms of Wigner. But, but you know, the same sort of thing. So there's going to be a question, if it, you know, do I have something at 4.1 or 5 or 40? And so 4.1, I don't know, 5 is well above the fluctuation. 40, you know, well, well above the fluctuation. So um, it, it's marchenko pasteur is what we're actually using, not, not the Wigner result. Here's a table with gobs of stuff that says, um, if your basic MP, this is where all the, most of the theory is done. This is you know, your Gaussian entries, or anything Gaussian like fix the mean, fix the variance. Um, you're in a Gaussian universality class, so it looks Gaussian. Um, you're going to get marchenko pasteur distribution, tracy widom edge fluctuations. You're not going to have a tail. There's, there's going to be a difference between asymptotically and not. But if you're Gaussian, you know, there's, there's sort of no difference. right? The point of Chernoff bounds is you can get a finite size version of the asymptotic results sort of cleanly. Um, spike covariance is basic MP with one or a few spikes. And, and the theory is sort of the same. You get a bulk, you get fluctuations of the bulk, and you get a few things sitting out here. Um, what if your entries are not fixed mean, fixed Gaussian, random otherwise, uh, fixed mean, fixed variance, random otherwise, but they have a heavy tailed structure? So as an idealization, think power law. It doesn't have to, the parametric form doesn't have to be power law, but you're heavy tailed. Then a lot of the theory breaks down because the concentration is much weaker and it's a much harder thing to deal with, right? Most of what we do in randomized linear algebra is not that. Um, there you get a much richer set of results. 
and there's several different universality classes depending on whether it's a power law or a different parametric form like a Levy structure. And in the power law case, whether the exponent roughly is above 4, then 4 moment results hold within 2 to 4, which is a hard regime, and less than 2 when you're so heavy tailed that you just see that. The interesting regime is the 2 to 4. Um, in these regimes, if you're heavy tailed over the entries, to, you know, the, the sort of TLDR is you're heavy tailed over the eigenvalues. The exponents, there's some connection there. But the intermediate regime um, is non-trivial because what you see at finite size is, is qualitatively different results than you see it in the asymptotic case. And so for Gaussian you know, random matrix theory, random matrix theory is nice because you're 500 by 500 matrix and you see what you see asymptotically. You can be 50,000 by 50,000. You wouldn't see the asymptotic result kick in for heavy tails in this intermediate regime, which is what we'll see is the interesting part. So you've so you got to model the finite size effects as well as the, the asymptotic effects. And you say, why? It's because we want to look at the real data, and this is where the real data will be. I mean, if, if the real data was somewhere else, life would be easier, but, but it's not. So there's a lot going on here that I'm just going to sort of gloss over. Was there a hand? Yeah. Um, fitting heavy tails is non-trivial. People want to use a log-log plot. If you're obscenely heavy-tailed like the blue, yeah, you have a log-log plot. If you're not, this, you're, you're a line on a log-log scale. If you're in between, that doesn't look like a line on a log-log scale. So there's a, there's a bit of an art here because, you, again, you get in, inconsistent estimators, so you've got to use these, and, and um, it's not, it's not, um, it's not, so th th these results we didn't invent. These are used in f mathematical finance. They, you know, they're totally standard, but, but um, you know, um, the, it's, it's not as, you know, the universality is much weaker than you'd have in the Gaussian case, this finite size effects and so on. Okay, lo we looked at a lot of big models. So Lynette 5, 1998 was state of the art. This is when you um, looked at, at digits of, uh, looked at digits of uh, handwritten digits. So Lynette 5, and AlexNet in 2012 and everything after that we'll, we'll see is qualitatively different. So here's just to show that, you know, there's a range of models and a range of different sizes. And you know you have hundreds of millions of parameters and billions of parameters. Um, um, here's a table of numbers that say we're good at something. Um, so Lynette 5, what you see is this. Boom, 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 boom. Red is the best MP fit. That's pretty good. Boom, 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 boom. What we'll see is that this is basically a spiked covariance model. Um, essentially. And, and it's spiked covariance because there's a bulk that's very well fit. There's an edge that's pretty crisp, you know, right there. Is that in the bulk or not? Or is this a fluctuational effect from Tracy Whittem? Or is this an eigenvalue that sticks out? If this was the only one, you know, I don't know. We wouldn't be able to say anything. Five, this four and a half clearly sticks out. This is a zoomed in plot. So there's, da, 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 there's stuff out here at, at 20. <coughs> so this is a very good fit to the bulk. The, the edge effects, you know, little question mark. And then there's a bunch of spikes. This, everything after 2013, Lynette 5, sorry, AlexNet, looks this way. Bulk. Very poorly fit. Very poorly fit. You've eaten out a massive amount of mass there. You don't have a sharp edge. These eigenvalues bleed out. They bleed out to 4, dot, 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 dot. So you have stuff sticking out there. But, but you're nowhere near you know, well approximated by a Marchenko pressure distribution plus edge. This is reasonably well fit with a power law in the regime 2 to 3, so the bad regime you want to deal with. Um, essentially, everything we've seen since then looks like that. There's an exception or two. Um, Inception's one of the exceptions because you actually get some funky envelope thing here. But I could show you, you know, 100,000 plots and 950 of them look like that. And then there's a bunch of exceptions like this. So think of this as everything since 2013. It's well, reasonably well fit by a heavy tail of power law distribution. So nowhere close to a you know, Gaussian random matrix. You are trying to talk about the bulk. I mean, there is no spike in this situation because you're a heavy tail. You're, you're not just good. Goes to so, so the default that people want to, the way people want to view the world is Gaussian. This bulk, this spike. That's the wrong way to view it. Is, is the message here? Um, probably a better way actually is that you're always heavy tailed. But since the the extreme values get washed out because of finite size effects, as a modeling question. You know, if, you're, if your power law parameter is pretty large, means you're not extremely heavy tailed, you know, how can you tell the difference between that and a bulk plus spike? So the bulk, you know, if, if you were to look at a heavy tailed data set, so that's the way you view the world, and you say my parameter is sort of large, you'd have something that looks pretty well fit by MP plus one or two things that stick out. 
would very well be about the spike covariance model. I mean, the only reason I started this way is this, this is the way most people view it, but I think this is actually the right way to view it. You, you know, you, you have this sort of heavy-tailed structure as sort of the natural, and, and it makes sense because you're cooking in correlations at many size scales during the training process. So this is sort of the, uh, and, and the point here is that this is, this is Tikhonov regularization. Right, there's a scale. Below that scale is sort of noise, and above that scale is sort of signal. If I cut there, I get my 95%. To get from 95 to 99.9, there's signal buried in there. I, I can't see it through the lens of global eigenvectors, but you, know, you cut a scale and you say good, bad. If you're heavy-tailed, um, that's not the case. There's no scale where you, I mean, being a power law means that there's no scale at which you can cut. You can cut anywhere, but, but there's no scale at which you can cut and say above this is signal and below that's noise. So um, we, we use the bulk and the spike to say you can come up with several different qualitatively types of end states of training. I can be random-like, meaning I could have correlations built in there, but I can't distinguish with global eigenvectors. I can be you know, random-like with a bit of bleeding out. I can be this bulk plus spike. I can be, you know, have a bit more bleeding out where I eat out this, or I could be heavy-tailed. So this is really I'm random-like. I'm bulk plus spike. I'm heavy-tailed, as well as some intermediate cases and some corner cases. So this is a phenomenological theory. It's not a theorem, it's a theory. And you know, so we posited these different stages of training. Um, and you know, is this the case that you can um, describe? So lots of technical issues. This is what I said that you're, you can look at eigenvectors. There's a million other things you can look at than just this one statistic. Yeah? These are trained models, so they were trained on, on the data. Yeah. Does that make a difference? Does I don't change the data? I, I'm doing the post-mortem on the patients who survived. I don't want to look at their lifestyle, and you know, I, I, didn't, I can't tell them to eat their broccoli 10 years ago. I just look at the, they survived. I can ask if they ate broccoli then, and the ones that survived may have eaten broccoli, and the ones that didn't survive maybe didn't, right? So, so what, what I see would be affected by that. I don't want to look at the broccoli, right? I, I don't want you to have to give me the data that you trained to, and I don't want to peek at data during the training process because that'll bias what I'm doing. So I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at things that are influenced by data someone else did, but I'm not touching it. So this is good. We, um, we predicted that there's going to be a bunch of end states of training. Um, and so um, you can vary dropout. You can vary learning rate. You can vary all these things. Because we're interested in, in batch size for a range of reasons that I'm not going to talk about, what if you vary batch size from large batch to small batch? Um, there's a million details here. If you're large batch, you're random-like. Decrease the batch, decrease the batch, you get a bit of this bleeding out. Decrease the batch, you get bulk plus spike. Decrease the batch some more, decrease the batch some more, decrease the batch some more, you're heavy tailed. So batch size, so, so, so think of low rank as, you know, this is one signature of regular, regularity, right, if you're low rank or heavy, you know, some, something on the eigenvalue spectrum. So we're looking at a spectral statistic here, and we can say, um, essentially, smaller batches correspond to more regularized models. So smaller batches have worse computational properties in terms of latency and throughput, but you get better statistical properties. You get better inferential properties because they'll correspond to more regularized models. So we're looking at using random matrix theory as a model, heavy-tailed random matrix theory as a model, not to model noise the way it usually is in the marchenko pasturch case, but to model signal, in particular to model strong correlations over many size scales. And so, and so the, people have done this before. So, we, but, so we're using random matrix theory to model signal, not noise. So it seems like you have a sort of a smooth transition between sort of two classes of distributions here, right? The one with the bulk and the one with the hip, uh, yeah. uh, power law, right? So, so then. So, so based on the random matrix theory, so, so is there like, is this like uh, a specific class of, you know, like a, like mathematical distributions where you can fiddle with a parameter? Yeah, not yet. I, I think that's I, the way to do that. I think would be to look at a heavy-tailed structure and, and, and show that as as you go from the heavy-tailed back to heavy-tailed with the parallel exponent being much less, you see things that are phenomenologically indistinguishable from a bulk plus spike, and then in some limit, basically, it's CMP. Resolve when, when the power law parameter gets such that essentially you have means and variance is controlled. So at the moment you, you don't have like a, a, a distribution fit with like two parameters and you can go from, from the plot, top left to the. We, we can fit. It is not a general theoretic result. But yeah, it certainly has a fit. Yeah. Um, so that's about it. We can apply the theory. We can use different things. You applied it to BERT and a million other things. Um, we can use it to go to the, your desert island and predict generalization. I won't tell you that about. I said we know why deep learning works. And in, in other situations, we have complex correlations. Here, it's built into the training process because you tr look at the data many times. This is state-of-the-art models. If you looked at the dead patients, if you trained to noise, you wouldn't see this. You'd damage this. 
and why is that? And the idea would be that you're um, engineering in sort of, sort of a rugged convexity. And since David's about to throw me off stage, the teaser, I'll just give you a teaser and you can ask me. You're engineering in sort of a rugged convexity. And you don't get stuck in this minimum or that minimum or that minimum because you have so many knobs to fiddle with. You can change your batch size. That's a regularization parameter. You can change your step size. That's a regularization. You, you can change anything you want. That's a regularization parameter. Means that you'll cook this out. But, but this is a regularization parameter that doesn't sort of have a, have a scale because you can fiddle with all of these. And so you, end, you, you fiddle with the many regularization. It's like, it's like a model. We have a Gaussian model, but you, you have a Gaussian over the variances, right? And so that, you can use that to model correlations over many size scales. So essentially, you're modeling in a heavy-tailed structure. And that will sort of short circuit the pathologies of a Gaussian spin glass. So you just have no large scale structure. What's going on here tells you nothing about what's going on here. Whereas here, what's going on here, an expectation tells you something about what's going on here. And so that's not a worst case statement. That's a statement about the world that is, is these sort of uh, strongly correlated models. So why does it work? It works because you cook in a convexity. And of course, you get to a minimum. And whether you get to there or there, people make a big deal about. It. But the point is, you never end up over there. And so we got all this by looking at. Uh, the spectral properties and um, thinking hard about what's going on. So, oh, so how do you put more theory on this? And so we looked at some of the points of the, the randomized linear alge algebra, so the theory broke down, and this is what popped out. So this is um, an FYI. Yeah, so, so this is, you, you get different results on different layers. Um, you see things at the convolutions versus fully connected. So um, if there was a three hours, I could go through all that. So, so this is just the 10,000 foot view. But, the, but, but in your experience, the last layer is the one that manifests, the shortest stuff more clearly? So oftentimes you see this more clearly. Um, I, I don't know that it's that simple, because if you have a very complicated architecture, there might be something in the middle that's a, that's a, that's a pain point that's particularly important. So on the simple things I was showing you, that's the case. But other ones, that may not be the case. Sorry, one question for you. So um, your title was about convergence or something, right? So what's, no. What was exactly the title? It, it's, we want to explain why it works. And it works because you've, you've cooked in coral, you, you adjust the weights to cook in correlations of a many size scales so the surface is convex. But so of course, you, you, of course you get to the minimum. And, and, and uh, this, I would call a, an empirical study. It's not really like about like proving those. I didn't prove anything. We, didn't, right? we, we, we wanted a theory. We wanted a theory. And the theory, we did an empirical study. We looked at the edge effects. Mm -hmm. And we said, um, based on what we looked at in the world, we developed a theory, these 5 plus 1 n phases. We showed that these phases exist. And, how and, and then we said, based on this thing that I glossed over at the end, that um, you, you short circuit the, um, the pathologies of the Gaussian spin glass. You engineer in a rugged convexity. And so these, these, these penalty surfaces are ruggedly convex. When I say rugged, I mean, you know, there's little local bumps that you can wash out by changing the batch size or whatever. But, but um, it's, 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 it's ruggedly convex. And so you get to, you know, the shape of this convexity would correspond to the number of states, which would be related to an entropy count, which gives you a generalization. Open problem, you know, show that's the case. But I'm, something like this would be the case. Because this whole thing is like a, a deep learning is basically an empirical study, right? Like, so, I, so what's the advantage over maybe other methods in this regard? I mean, no one can answer why except sell stories. We looked at data. We developed a theory. We made a prediction. It's a pretty bold thing to say something exists. You know, you just invented something. We showed all five phases exist by changing an endogenous computational parameter, mm -hmm. which secretly is a regularization parameter. You can show that all five phases exist. The things I glossed over at the end that um, go to the desert island. I mean, you can get better predictive cap capacity for distilled models that norm bounds don't give you. I mean, you, 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 I, this will give you metrics that you can take to your desert island. It, VC theory doesn't even come close to that. Stochastic optimization theory doesn't even come close to that. The, the, the form of statements there is, if conditions hold, then I get such results. Mm -hmm. Those conditions don't hold. Sometimes the results are useful or not. But but it, it doesn't give you a predictive theory that would explain why something works. So this is, you can like this or not, but that's the, that's the form of the question that was asked. Thanks. Can you also explain this phenomenon of dual tangent kernel you think this? So nowadays the, the dual tangent kernel is getting popular. Yeah. I think you can use this to also explain the convergence in kernel because what you're seeing is. Yeah, the neural tangent kernel is sort of a, a, an asymptotic thing. That, that's not the case for, as best we can tell, for anything state of the art. So if you need to go to the desert island and do something state of the art, you wouldn't do this. People do this, I think, because it's analytically convenient. So you make some layer wide. If you make 
fix the number of rows, you make this layer wide, you're going to some asymptotic regime. You're not letting both diverge, so you do it because it's analytically convenient. It may or may not shed light on what's going on, but, but right. you're in that regime. But this experiment, if you do with increasing the width, you may actually you know, see something or validate something like that. So, so you, you would, and you do see that. I mean, that's a different question than saying, what do, what do people do state of the art? But if, if you make this wide, you know, some of these results will break down. Because if you give yourself lots of random bits to fit to, the concentration is going to be very different than in the heavy-tailed case. If I'm a 500 by 1,000 matrix, and that's the only place I have to jam my information into those parameters, that's going to be very different than if I'm 500 by a million. And, and you run those experiments? Um, which ones? I, I mean, do you look at very wide? Numbers? We didn't look at the very wide ones, but we have other results that I'd be very surprised if something like that wasn't the case, yeah. We looked at a range of different models which mimic that and a couple other things. Not that exact thing, but yeah. But, but I'd be surprised if that wasn't the case. Okay. All right.